Jonathan's parents divorced when he was in the third grade. After that, he only celebrated one more Christmas with his dad and brother when he was in the sixth grade. They lived in Eugene, Oregon with his dad's girlfriend, Nancy, and her daughter. That's where Jonathan and his two sisters were delivered for that year's Yuletide festivities. Nancy, who appreciated structure, organized the opening of presents Christmas morning as such. All sat in a circle in the living room. Nancy grabbed one present at a time and handed it to its recipient, who would open it and then pass it around the circle for everyone else to hold and inspect. Repeat for each individual present. That's how Christmas morning went for close to three hours. When that was over, Jonathan took solace that he would have the rest of the day to enjoy his gifts. But no. Dad and Nancy had other plans. They loaded all the kids up in the car and set out for an undisclosed location. What unfolded next made for the most unforgettable Christmas day ever. From our studios in Charlotte, North Carolina, this is the Psych Bites Podcast. The Psych Bites Podcast is where mental health professionals offer practical psychology to enhance your life. I'm Dr. Craig Pullman, neurodevelopmental psychologist. I'm Jennifer Feitz, licensed professional counselor. In this episode, we're talking about families, including how definitions of family have evolved. We'll cover some common challenges today's families face and share strategies for overcoming those challenges. In the opening, you heard just part of the true story of the last Christmas Jonathan ever spent with his father. After we discuss definitions of family, challenges today's families face, and tips for handling those challenges, we'll end that story. Be sure to stick around because what happened next was, well, just wow. Yeah, it's, that's going to be worth sticking around for. Um, I bet you've got some crazy family stories in your, in your closet <laughs> fights. Well, I mean, can we just say that, like, my family is crazy, and so therefore we have lots of crazy family we stories. We got a lot of credibility. <laughs> we, have, we feel for this like episode. we have prime real estate in crazy. So let's let's share a little bit about our family situations. Let, let's start by describing our our childhood families, w- known as family of origin. Okay, so my family of origin. This is very fancy. We're using fancy words. Um, is I am the youngest of three kids. Grew up with a mom and a dad, so intact marriage. They actually do 56 years of marriage this summer, which That's is like a aw really cool. moment. It's actually very amazing. I'm very proud of them. Um, so young as a three, I have two older brothers that are actually 10 years and eight years older than me. So there's a significant gap between me and my next brother. Okay, so we're going to, again, we're going to get into definitions here in just a moment. But what you're describing is, I guess, what you'd call... Kind of the stereotypical, <laughs> yeah, like American sort of family. old, old-fashioned, standard parents stay married forever. Yeah, mar- you married know, young, pretty married, young, extremely young. I mean, they married when they were still in college. Right. Okay. Not so for me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, so my parents met when they were in college. Okay. And they got married. I think my my dad may have just graduated. I think my mom may have had. One year left, maybe. That's actually the same for my parents, but reverse. Was it? My mom was a year older than my dad. Okay. And and my parents were married just shy of 10 years. Okay. They had me and my brother. Okay. So for about a decade, we were the prototypical nuclear family. family. Yep. Um, But then they divorced. Mm -hmm. And uh, this was in Montana. And we had lived in Butte, Montana. And then my mom, brother, and I moved to Bozeman, which is about an hour down the road. And so we didn't move that far from my dad. And so we still saw him a lot. Good. And they both remarried pretty quickly. And when I say pretty quickly, like, I think my dad remarried first. Because they found the one other human of the opposite sex that lived in Montana then at that point? No. No, um, because... Let me just cut this short. I mean, uh, my my dad is is now married to his fourth wife, and my mom is married to her third husband. Okay. So I I have a very different family situation. Right. Right. Um, my my parents have have been in several marriages. Okay. So how, how about like how how about now with your your family? So like then your, interestingly, your, your, your husband, your we kids. all sort of then interestingly followed suit, except I was a little bit different, which 
culturally was interesting within my family. So my brothers both married their high school sweethearts. So my oldest brother met his wife when they were 16. Um, and then my middle brother met his wife when he was a senior and she was a junior in high school. And that was like, now you know the end of the story, right? So then my oldest brother and his wife do 28, 29 years of marriage, 29, 29 years of marriage this June. And my middle brother and his wife do 25. It's their, no, 26, their 26th wedding anniversary. But they both married early, young, just sort of like my parents, which sort of matched culturally what we were supposed to do. I, being the rebel that I am, waited until after grad school. And that was a little unusual. I was 27 were, when I got married. Were people giving old. up hope? Oh, a hundred percent. I mean, my my grandmother <laughs> used to spinster like fights. Well, she would she would whisper like she would like pretend whisper and go, "Is she gay?" And I would be like, "Yes, Grandma, I'm gay. That's because of why course, I'm single, right?" Because gay people can't find love in well, marriage. Or as a woman, if you're over the age of twenty five and not married, there is something wrong with you. So yeah, it was just. It was just weird, like I, because I was over the age of twenty five and not married. There was something. There must be something wrong with me. But now we are that standard family. So my husband and I will do fifteen years this year, mm -hmm. two kids, pretty pretty standard. Right. Yeah. And so, yeah, I've been married. It'll be coming up on nineteen years. We've got three sons and my brother, my younger mm -hmm. brother. He um, close to that length of marriage and mm -hmm. got, had two sons. So, um, yeah, my brother and I, we've we've got a different path. <laughs> than than our mm -hmm. parents did in in terms mm -hmm. of finding life partners and and I, I guess having what you, what you'd call well, I, I keep saying stereotypical or prototypical right. I, I don't, but it's really not anymore and I think that's one of the interesting absolutely. things we're going to talk about today is that I think and sometimes people get stuck with this idea of what is family look like or what is it supposed to look like or am I doing it quote unquote right versus wrong so I, mean, I love that we're going to talk about this today because I keep using the word standard but really it's not anymore right it's it's what would you say old school like yeah, we're back we're, in the day but we're we're retro retro family yeah that that actually is kind of cool R retro family <laughs> so, it comes with a cape yeah so so why why don't we go why don't we go there now why don't we talk about family definitions and then in the second segment we'll we'll start talking about challenges that families face and then in the third segment we'll get into solutions so Let's go through some some different definitions. Now, let's start with the Merriam-Webster dictionary's definition. So why, why, why not go to a dictionary if you want a definition of something? So <laughs> uh, the fam family is defined as a group consisting of parents and children living together in a household, all the descendants of a common ancestor. That's, okay. that's kind of a narrow definition, don't you think? Well, and it is. And I mean, but if you, I mean, we're going to go through all of these and I mean... They all sort of have a very one-way view of sort of looking at family until you get to the last one. Right. But Cambridge, yep. so the, the fancy British people, right. a social group of parents, children, and sometimes grandparents, uncles, aunts, and others who are related. Yeah, you know, both of these definitions so far don't really fit in adoptive families. No. Because th there's an emphasis on... Blood ties. So that's a very that's a very narrow right. And I was going to say this all means that there's blood relation between all of them too. Right. Okay. So you, you mentioned the Cambridge Dictionary. So let's go to the Oxford Dictionary. Shortest. It, it defines family as a group consisting of two parents and their children living together as a unit. That is way narrow. Right. Because now you take out at least Cambridge grave grandparents, aunts, uncles. So this is just two parents, which means no blended families. Right. And now now I I, I, I want to add this to my story, my recollection. Mm -hmm, my, mm -hmm. So after my parents got divorced, there was a, a, my mom did remarry, but there was a good stretch in there when it was just her and my two brothers. So we were a single parent household and my mom was great at that. And my, my dad was very involved. He, we, mm -hmm. we saw him all the time. But my mom. You know, she was a breadwinner, and she was putting herself through school, oh, wow. and she was taking care of the two of us, and we were very happy. Uh, so, yeah, it, it's a, a family obviously does not have to mean mm -hmm. two parents, mm -hmm. and there are some families that have more, you know, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. three or more mm -hmm. parents. Well, and I mean, it's interesting. I, I, you know, we've got a couple more of these to define, but then, I mean, it, just hearing you talk about that brings up a, a cute story with my daughter the other night from watching a TV show, but it really does show this idea of where we can get 
get stuck with what a quote unquote family is supposed to look like and the idea of a single parent. So Wikipedia defines family as a group of people related either by consanguinity, and I should get some sort of a reward <laughs> for saying that correctly. I was just thinking about consanguinity in the shower this yeah, morning. Yeah, just, you know, I think my mother calls those 75 cent words, which means by recognized birth, affinity, which means marriage or other relationships, or co-residence or some combination of these. So it's a little the, broader. Yeah, this definition is more about like where you li- like who you live with, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. not why you're living with them. Right, so, shared space. Right, which okay, that's that's a little different take on it, that physical mm-hmm, proximity, mm-hmm, but I mm-hmm. and that's important. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But to me that's still pretty that narrows the field um because you could have like with my family situation, mm-hmm. I my dad did not live with us. He was mm-hmm. an hour down the road, but mm-hmm. he was very involved in our lives. So I, I still considered him part, part of, of our your family. family. Yeah. Right. So it does. It's it's. I feel like none of these are perfect. There's always no. there's something missing from each one of these definitions. That's right. So let, um, let, let's, yeah, last one. Yeah, the Urban Dictionary. So it defines family as a group of people, usually of the same blood, but do not have to be, who genuinely love, trust, care about, and look out for each other. Not to be mistaken with relatives sharing the same household who hate each other. Real family is a bondage that cannot be broken by any means. Now, the ones we've gone through, I'm I'm the most cool with this definition. Well, I mean, it, and and it really does, and it and it it goes into what we even discussed before about the idea of like even like how gangs begin to see themselves as families. Uh, right. Right. I mean, and that I mean that's a big component. Of that, so this really is the definition Sports that seems to teams. most right. It seems to most match this idea of family becomes it's it's always meaningful. Yes, it usually involves another person, right? But it's more about the meaning behind what an individual or group of people become for you. But to your point about single parents, when my daughter and I were watching TV, there was a single dad with a daughter, and she mm-hmm. was very taken by the idea that there wasn't a mom, mm-hmm. like, and that this little girl only had a dad and what had happened to the mommy and why was he the only one there with his daughter? I mean, so it's just interesting how we already at a really young age have this idea of what family is supposed to look like based on what we see and what we interact with, right? right? So then this is then informs how we begin to look at this and how we see this and then what we take forward into interacting with other people. It's interesting. So, yeah, and I think for this Urban Dictionary definition, key terms there, love, trust, Caring, looking out for each other, and maybe maybe those are maybe those are the factors that are most important, regardless of genetic relations or physical proximity. It's it's, it's the emotions, it's those connections that you have mm-hmm. with other people. And you know, one bias I have is that a family should be like three or more people. It just seems like a group should be at least a, a triad. But I don't know. I mean, challenge me on that. I mean, can't, I guess you could have a single parent and and one. Oh, how about a, a, just a married couple? They don't have kids. They're, they're family, they're right? They're a family. I mean, I would say, but I think interestingly, like I was thinking about friends that we have that it's just the two of them, but then they have animals and, and they uh. perceive those as their family and like sort of their kids. But I think we all have these preconceived ideas of what it's supposed to look like. And I love this point that this makes about relatives sharing the same household who hate each other. That's right. not family, right? So then I think it even speaks to this idea that you can be living in the same household with people and not consider them family members. And I was thinking in my head of like our best friends, I I see as intimate members of our family. Like they are a part of my family. They don't live in our same household. But if I were to think of who my family is. They're them. But I, what keeps popping into my head is this idea of your tribe. Like, who's your tribe? Like, who are the people that at 3 o'clock in the morning would be there? Right. Sometimes that would be your brother or your sister or your parents. But it may not be. Like, I probably wouldn't call my brother at 3 o'clock in the morning. I'd call my best friend. Not because I don't think my brother loves me or, or, or wouldn't come if I called. But instinctually, that that's not – wouldn't be my go-to right now. Well, maybe, maybe that's where we should land, that, that- – I like that, that your family is your tribe, your family consists of the people that you would call at 3 o'clock in the morning with a problem. So what are some of the more common problems that families face? 
This is Jonathan Hetterly, a licensed professional counselor who works with many families in his therapy practice. And, by the way, he is the Jonathan of the Christmas Day story from the top of this episode. There really are three consistent issues that I tackle with families in therapy. The first issue is communication problems, the ability to talk and listen to one another. The second one would be expectations. As a family, we all have roles and expectations for one another. A lot of times they're spoken, but sometimes expectations are unspoken, and people may not even realize their expectations until they're not met, and they find themselves very irritated and upset with another family member. The third common issue that families face is dealing with change. Change can really disrupt the flow of families' schedules, communication, expectations, and roles, and oftentimes it can be a real struggle to transition with that change and find a healthy new normal. Now, a little later on, I'm going to provide some practical tips for families to navigate some of those issues that they face. But you can also check out Psych Bites for articles and videos and other resources to help you with psychology and family issues. So, Fights, in your therapy practice, how much do you work with families? So, I do a lot of family therapy. Like, when I introduce myself or on my bio, I'm an individual and family therapist. But I would say day in and day out, probably a quarter of my practice right now is doing family therapy. That's a lot. That's a lot. What, um, what, what are some of the common... I don't know, problems, issues, challenges that people come to you to fix (laughs) with your magic. I wish I had a magic wand for family therapy. I mean, interestingly, so I see families where there's students in the household, like, you know, young kids um, before they go off to college. But then I also have families that have kids in college and then adult children. Failure to launch situations. Well, failure to launch. But no, I mean, like, you know, working with a family where... A uh, guy is in his 40s doing family therapy with his much older parents. So recognizing and, and but what I was going to say, what brings this all together is usually I mean, it's all rooted in communication. Right. I mean, what this is rooted in is and you can and you can put it in lots of different ways. Right. So I'll do couples work and they'll come in and they say, well, we're having problems in our sex life. Well, no, you're having problems communicating about your sex life. Or we're not on the same age with discipline. Well, no, what what it is is you're not communicating equally about what you think about discipline. Or then you're not communicating that in the same way to your children, which is then creating an issue. So you can say it's lots of different things that bring you in for family therapy, but it's really always rooted in a communication issue. So so let me tell you what I see in my practice. Yeah, because I I know you do this too. Right. I I see a lot of of kids, uh, adolescents, and even college students who have learning problems, ADHD. And and when there's a family problem, it's generally rooted in expectations. Mm. So you've got parents who have expectations of their child, either overt or covert. It, mm-hmm, it, it, they mm-hmm. may not come right out and say it, but kids feel like they're not meeting up with those expectations. They're, they're not getting into the college that their parents want them to go to. They're not getting the GPA that's going to get them into the college that they want. So they feel like they're letting their parents down. And, and sort of helping people identify that has really been important um, because sometimes parents don't realize they're burdening their kids with expectations, and kids don't even realize what a burden it is to be under those expectations. And, and I think what's interesting then is I'm, I'm sure you could see a little bit like in my head I was listening to you and I was like, and I bet you the communication around that right. just gets out of whack. But I think one of the next steps to that, because I think it's such an excellent point you made and it, and it happens probably way more frequently than people realize, is then people end up sacrificing relationships to be right. Right. So, no, I, I'm right. And I'm going to go to the point that maybe our relationship ends up being you know, hopefully only momentarily, but maybe permanently damaged to prove that that I am right or or that my way of doing it is the right way of doing it. 
or this is the way that this is supposed to go. So I think that's one of the other challenges that I really see and have said to people, like, you are going to permanently damage the relationship that you have with your child if this continues to be the thing that you fall on your sword about. That if we can't find a different way to communicate about this or to, to be perspective taking about it, the, the relationship is going to suffer to the point of maybe you're not going to be able to get it back. Communication is, is key, is king. So what, what about divorce? How often do you work with families who are either going through a divorce or have divorced and they're trying to pick up the pieces? Not as often because I think there's a recognition that, that I mean, it, as much as people like to say that they're effectively co-parenting, it's, it's really rare when I can get a set of parents who are either in the process of or who are divorced into family therapy. And I think sometimes people have really, really you know, great ideals and really think that they can do it, but but there's a reason why a family ended up getting divorced. What usually happens more is I work with those students and then try to do some co-parenting work with one parent or the other. But I mean, I think that's one ground where family therapy is necessary and is needed, but is really, really difficult, really hard. You, you know, one, one interesting thing that, that links the research to my experience with, with my family and my parents' divorce Research has shown that it's not so much the divorce that affects kids, it's the conflict. Oh, but doesn't and that make sense? It totally makes sense. Yeah. <laughs> so here's the thing. Like, my parents divorced when I was five years old. I have never seen them fight or argue, ever. They, just, that, they did not have a tumultuous marriage in that way, and they were very— um, it was not an acrimonious divorce at all. In fact, I, I t said that you know we moved down the road to, from Butte to Bozeman. Mm -hmm. My dad helped us that day that we moved. Oh, gosh, he drove the story. moving truck with me and my brother, and we and we had a. It was one of the funnest days of my life. It, just, mm -hmm. it was a great, great time with my dad. So we had. Uh, I was not exposed to that parental conflict, so I was spared those difficulties. So even though I've gone through a lot of divorce, I haven't gone through the really tough stuff that affects people. And that's what I see when I see students in my office that are really struggling with their parents' divorce. What they really are struggling with is the, the, the things that mom continues to say about dad or the things that dad continues to say about mom or that inability for mom and dad to communicate with each other in the best interest of their, of their kid to simple things like homework and where are my sneakers mom and dad can't communicate with each other and it ends up making the kid feel so stuck in the middle or the child ending up responsible to make sure their parents can communicate with each other there's this great book that i use that's called um it must have been the chocolate pudding and it's geared towards a, like little little humans to try to understand divorce, right? Like this little guy spills his bowl of pudding all over the floor, the chocolate pudding all over the floor, right before his parents say that they're getting divorced. And so then he thinks it's that, right? right? But what's funny is I have used that going all the way up to students who are in high school and college trying to explain this idea to parents. Like you have to communicate with your kids around the fact that it has nothing to do with them, that this is a you and your partner problem. And then you got to act like it, right? Like, please act like the grown up that you are and communicate effectively and not put your child in the middle of your own mess. So, so what you're saying is it's the communication. It's not the chocolate pudding. It is not the chocolate pudding. Joining us as usual is our quiz mistress extraordinaire, Mara Teal. Mara is a therapist, writer, and mom. She is here to quiz me and Craig, which is a euphemism for humiliating the crap out of us for our lack of knowledge. What up? How's, <laughs> how's it going? Welcome. <laughs> Let Ms. the humiliation <laughs> commence. Okay, so let's just clarify the rules a little bit here. Um, you have to answer. So even if you have no idea, you got to give me something. And then I will decide who wins based on who's the closest, sometimes most creative, you know, we kind of make it up as we go, but Stop I will decide. Stop can help. Yes, absolutely. I don't like this feeling of I have to answer. You have I'm to. I'm a big pleader of the fifth. You can do it. How I live life. Yep. Um, and just so you know, these questions apply to this topic. So we're doing um, questions about TV families. Oh, Hopefully all right. you will know some of these shows. Um, but, you know, like a lot of these situations mimic real life, so... Okay. Will Dynasty be one yeah. of the TV families oh, we discussed? Oh, God, I discuss? hope not. Um, Ooh, Sopranos. No. Can we get some the Sopranos Ewings. in there? 
That was, okay. So many TV shows to name right now. <laughs> <laughs> okay, are you ready? Yes. As I'll ever yes. be. First one. So we're going to go um, fights. I believe you won. I did the win. Last, I the won. Last I win. forgot. The last I don't, one, I'm Craig. not sure that's true. I don't win. I, I don't forget these things. I'm I won. I'm pretty sure you did. So yeah. we're going to let fights kick this off. Okay, so in the show, The Brady Bunch, why was Marsha unable to go on her date with high school hunk Doug? Marsha, Marsha, Marsha. Mm-hmm. Um, because he was way older than her. I, I don't know. I do you know what's funny? I don't think I've ever watched an episode of Brady Bunch, to oh. be totally honest. Okay. My face is showing disappointment. I know. I guess I look at it and I'm like, I immediately know that How I'm is wrong that by the face that you just gave me. I'm thinking it's like modern that? day, like he's too Okay, before old I give too her. much away, Craig, what what you got? I'm gonna go with illness. Guys, I am this Uh-oh. is sad. She is disappointed. All right. So you're saying illness? Yes. All right. I, I will give you point three points because for real, I feel like you don't even have to have watched the show in order to see the scene of Marsha with a blown <gasps> up nose. She had the broken nose. Yes. She had the, now I know what you're talking about. She had the broken nose. Her I know. Brother, she's over the banister. Peter hit her in the face with a football yep. and broke her nose. Oh, I remember yeah. that It's now. like the classic. Come on, I knew guys. it was some sort of, I should have said ailment. But and he yeah, was I would something immediately medical like problem. the standard, like I, he was too old. I, I, thought she like, I, I thought that maybe she'd broken out into hives or had the measles yeah, or something. Yeah. And so that's why I said illness to sort of cover the cover most Cover your ground. bases. Uh, I, I, yeah. That's cheating. But let's, let's, let's be clear here. I am in the lead. <laughs> you can take right. your point. One, three one points. question in. Here we go. Okay. Um, next question. So in the hit show Friends, Chandler kisses Joey's girlfriend. As a result, Joey forces Chandler to do what? Uh, forces to go kiss somebody else. Okay. <laughs> Isn't this the episode where he steals Chandler's clothes in the bathroom, where he ends up leaving him naked in the bathroom? Am I mixing my episodes? Because Chandler constantly pisses off Joey when it comes right. to women. Yes, that's the Julia Roberts episode. That's that the you Julia were Roberts to. episode when this he was mean a, to her. This in, is right. So this is no. retribution. Damn. I but I mean I love Julia Roberts, so I'm going to give you I'm going to give you ten thousand points for just you know because I like it. You can take your point three <laughs> points, Craig. <laughs> okay, I, so I, I think I'm yeah I'm mixing up another I th- Ross and Joey had something going on where they had like. Anyway, no. I'm I'm defending myself. My yeah, I, I don't know. the The answer is that Joey forces Chandler to sit in a wooden box for a few hours yes. to think about their friendship. <laughs> Real sweat God, box. I love yes. friends. Yep. Is that was that's what they had the duck too, right? And he was like waddling around him. Yes, it was great. Yes. Okay. All right. So fights. You get the next one. So, why did Will Smith move into his aunt and uncle's house in Fresh Prince of Bel Air? Oh, because there was an issue on the playground. No. Uh, Because there was (laughs) violence in his neighborhood, and his mama didn't feel he was safe on the playground. Yes, and I'll add that he moved from Philadelphia. Oh, Oh, a little detail. I like it. Okay, but can you wrap the entire opening lyric to Fresh Prince of Bel-Air? Summertime! No. Oh, Oh, my gosh. Oh, no. Mm -mm. Fights, do you know it? Uh, I just need the opening thing, and I can get started. Philadelphia, yeah, born, born and raised. raised on the playground is where I spent most of my days. Chilling out, maxing, relaxing, or killing or shooting some b-ball outside of the school when a couple of guys, they were up to no good. Started making some trouble in my neighborhood. I got one little fight and my mom got scared, and so she moved me with my aunt and uncle in Bel Air. Yes, Laura! That right, is cool. epic. <laughs> <laughs> well done. You okay, so Craig, I, I will give I you... It. All right, I'll give you... Um, I mean, fights, you got to get some. You you came up with the correct answer first. I did technically come first. up with the correct answer. I'm going to give you 27 it. points. Craig, I'm giving you 25. Okay. Okay, okay. cool. All right. Hmm. In the show Family Ties, what did Alex realize about his uncle Ned when Alex was up late at night studying for his economics exam? The, this is all you. Oh, I got wow. nothing. Uh, that he is a lifelong Democrat. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Uncle Ned has an awful porn addiction. <laughs> okay, so <laughs> I'm not that off. <laughs> You're not that far off. I'm gonna give you ten points. The answer is he realizes his uncle Ned has a serious drug problem. Another addiction. You're on the Another, addiction. Yeah, I was on the addiction yeah. track. You should have said addiction. Yeah. 
I mean, you just should be right. I mean, you know what I mean? Or you just should know the answer to the question. I am getting my butt handed to me. All right, you got one more chance. Get used to it, Paul. I think I think you should get this next one. Just uh, who's that? I've I've watched these shows. I mean, I I feel really incompetent. (laughs) Okay. All right. What happened to Joey's car when Stephanie was left unsupervised in the show Full House? This is to me. I'm I'm going first here. Yeah, go for it. This what is also the, kind of a classic. Mm-hmm. I'm not a Full House guy, so I'm going to say it was Toad. Okay. Didn't she drive it? <laughs> Didn't she get in the car and drive it? Okay. Yeah. You, you want to like keep going with that a little bit? Um, oh gosh, now I'm not gonna because I have the visual of her getting into the car. Um, she drove it and like crashed it into the like the river or the lake or something, right? Okay, we're going to give you 50 points. Okay. She Thank crashes you. it into the house. Oh, that's right. So, yes, loses control, drives it and straight, the house. straight into but, the house. But how are you going to get the the car out of the house? You're going to have to tow it, right? <laughs> so I guess uh, it's there. Really I think I get right? partial credit for that. I think I maybe the car still works. You can back it up out of the gigantic hole that she just Unlikely. created into the house. I think you need a professional so. to rectify this. Anyway, I believe that Fights has won. <sighs> yes. So, As I said, get used to it. <laughs> I acknowledge that there is a win streak to be had here. Yep. Who does not make a streak? Thank you, Mara. Until You're next welcome. time. Thanks for Woo-hoo. having me. So what are some practical tips for families dealing with communication, expectations, or change? The reality is it does come down to communication. The more effective families are with communication, the more they're going to be able to identify clear expectations in the family, and they're going to be able to deal with change, either things that they can problem solve or things that are out of their control, and they just make sure that they stick together as a family, as a team, as they face whatever adversity or challenges. So when we talk about communication, what are some of the practical tools? First, families really need to make communication both an ends and a means. What I mean by that is communicating for just communication's sake. Because talking with one another is a form of validation. It expresses availability to your loved ones. And the only way you're going to improve your communication is to practice it. Communication also doesn't mean just talking. It really is about the ability to listen and not interrupt somebody the second you hear something that you have a different opinion on. Another element about communication is not to jump into problem-solving mode right away. Oftentimes, we find that a lot of problems that families face are what we call perpetual problems. There's not a clear, simple solution, or it's a problem you're going to face in a reoccurring manner in your family. So the more families are able to talk through the problem rather than problem solve the problem, the more communication is going to become one of their tools and assets rather than one more issue that is creating conflict and division. So you make communication an ongoing dialogue. You open a line of communication. Especially in today's culture, we are busy as families. And oftentimes we want to rush and solve everything and say everything in one conversation. The reality is, is there's a lot of things going on in families' lives that require just checking in and checking up on. And we don't always have the ability to come to a clear resolution with one conversation. So open a line of conversation around a topic or a problem. And even if it's not resolved, uh, make, make a commitment to circle back and continue that line of conversation. Another incredibly essential tool for communication is is empathy. Empathy really is try to understand the other person. Put yourself in their shoes and try to get a sense of why they think and feel the way that they think and feel. You don't have to agree, but it's really making that effort because it's very validating to the other family members. And what I've really found in both families that I work with and in couples and in marriages, the The biggest boost of communication and empathy is that it shows that you're making an effort to the other person. And a lot of times that's the glue of what people need to stay in the game and do their part. The last thing that I would encourage when it comes to communication is is shift towards inquisitiveness. Um, Ask questions. 
like I said earlier with empathy, try to understand. Shift away from accusatory, which puts people on defensive and creates a wrong and right dynamic into acquisitiveness. Help me understand. I don't understand this. And that really is what we would call an open statement. And an openness really encouraged the other side to engage. So be sure to try out these practical tips and tools and also check out Psych Bites for more practical psychology tips to enhance your life. My name is Jonathan Hederly, licensed professional counselor. You can follow me on Twitter or check out Psych Bites or our sister website, shrinktank.com. In the first segment, we talked about definitions of families, and the one that we liked best came from Urban Dictionary, and that was about a group of people, not necessarily genetically related, who genuinely love, trust, care about, and look out for each other. And we sort of landed on there can be unique circumstances in each family, but most major challenges are rooted in communication problems. So here's a question that I bet a lot of people are wondering right now as they listen to this. At what point should a struggling family, one that's maybe mm-hmm. struggling mm-hmm. because of communication, at what point should they seek professional support from a therapist? I feel like this in certain ways is tough to answer because it's going to be so unique and personal for each family. But I think when you get to that point that you are arguing more days than not, when you are feeling like you are stuck that you can't get past things, right? Like you you are arguing about the same thing over and over again. If there's kids in the household, if you really begin to see, you know, that your kid is getting anxious or your kid is um, beginning to expect or assume that there's going to be a problem as opposed to you're going to figure it out. um, I think at that point, and I think what's interesting is that probably you know it when you need help. Deep down. Deep down. There's an aspect where you go, man, we are stuck. Or we're having the same argument over and over and over again. Or every time I see this person, there's an issue. And that's that's a really good way to go. Then then we need some help. And intelligent, wise, confident people ask for help. Right. No shame in it. There is no shame. At all. And we've got research to support. It's a sign of intelligence. It's a sign of wisdom. It's a sign of something, you know, ego strength, but what we call confidence, to know to ask for help and when to ask for help. So let's talk about what that help looks like. So we've already established communication, so important. What are some things that you do in your practice, in your sessions, to help families communicate better? So I think one of the first things that I do to go back to what you just said about shame is I normalize the fact that no family is perfect and actually healthy families fight with each other. Like when I have a family or a couple that comes into my office and apathy has begun to set in, sort of that idea of like, man, I don't don't care. I sort of nothing this person. I get more nervous than when I have a family that comes into my office and they are like at each other's throat, right? Because it means you are still in relationship with the other person. You still care. You're what engaged. They, they, you're still engaged, Even right? If like it's not you're still experiencing engagement. anger. You're still experiencing hurt. Okay, so I think I normalize a little bit. Like it's a really great thing that you're here, and no family is perfect, and 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 healthy families fight. And then we start with the idea of that it that it is okay to ask questions about what somebody said. It's okay to be honest about how you feel in a circumstance or to say, you know, if you have something important to impart to the other person, you know, what did you hear me say? What did you, what did you just hear me say to make sure that they're taking away what you really want to be heard or vice versa to say, okay, so this is what I just heard you say. So those are very simple things that it's okay to be honest about how you feel. So I have to be honest with you, that just really hurt my feelings. Or I'm super angry right now about what you said. Can we can we work through it? Can we talk about it? Um, So I think those are some quick things that I start right away, especially with with couples and then with parents with kids is after you say something that you feel is important to you to say, okay, what did you just hear me say? And keep having the conversation until the really important piece of information gets effectively communicated. And don't assume that if you've communicated something that you think perfectly, right? Like we all think that we said the clear right thing the very first time and we get frustrated when people don't hear what we have to say. 
don't assume that you're as effective communicating as you think you are. Be okay if somebody says, oh, I heard you say this. And for that not to be what you meant or heard to go, okay, let me try it again differently. Please do not then just turn around and say the same thing the same exact right. way. <laughs> be willing to be flexible and try it again. That's not a you problem or a them problem. Miscommunication happens because perspective is truth to the person perceiving it. Now, I'm curious, do you, because I know some therapists are very particular about uh, questions that actually script out questions and statements, and they're very careful with pronouns, like avoiding the use of you, as in you did this to me, more, more, make it more about I, like it's, so it, yeah. I you, statements. You, you we teach I statements, right? Well, and it's going to be way more effective. You're immediately going to put somebody on the defensive if you say you. Right. Like it's going to immediately going to fire in a part of their brain that has them go, oh, my God. Right. Like they said, blah, blah, blah. But if you start with I feel that X, if you're in relationship with this person, it means that they that they care about you. And if you're expressing some belief or some pers- you know opinion or perspective and you sort of are going to a vulnerable place for yourself, rarely in those relationships is somebody going to use that against you. We have this misnomer that if I become vulnerable to somebody else, they're going to use it against me. 99% of the time, that's not accurate. That's your brain trying to protect you and that's a whole other podcast, right? But like if you're honest and say, I, I'm feeling really hurt or I'm feeling really scared or I'm feeling really misunderstood, most of the time the person on the other side of that conversation, if it's a family member, is going to respond appropriately to that. But if you start out with you did X, it immediately puts the person on the defensive and they're going to in turn and maybe rightfully so defend themselves as opposed to listening to what you actually have to say. So what are some uh, some things that you would suggest to families if they're not in therapy? So one thing, like if, if I could spend, you know, if I only ever had one hour with a family and I had to teach them the most important thing, it would be the idea of validation perspective taking. Okay. Right? So this idea, you know, of being willing to validate somebody's thoughts and feelings and where lots of people get stuck is validation does not equal agreement. Right. I do not agree maybe with your perspective or your feelings, but I'm willing to see that maybe you could feel that way or that you could see it that kind of way. And and most people, if they feel like they've been heard, they're far more willing to stay in the game, be flexible, be willing to compromise because they feel like somebody sees where they're coming from. You know, And, you know, lang- language is so important. Oh, gosh. And you can... You can coach people to say things that validate in a way that doesn't feel like they're throwing in the towel. So you could you could provide validation to say, you're right and I'm wrong, but that's sort of like a win-lose situation. Mm-hmm. Or you could just say simply, I hear you. Mm-hmm. I oh. hear what you're saying. I get that. I understand what how you'd feel that way. It's so simple. I mean, I think that's the funny thing is, right, is it's not, this is not rocket science. This is not, you know, complex, or this is not also throwing in the towel and, and, and losing the argument. Just being willing to say, gosh, I could, I could really see how you get there. I, I could see that. And it's not agreeing. It's not saying, you know, or, or having to even to apologize. I'm, I'm sorry you feel that way. That's not agreeing with. So, so let, let unpack that idea of perspective taking, because I think that's really important for people to understand. So perspective, I mean, we've all heard that phrase, like walk a mile in somebody else's shoes, right? But it's that it's that willingness to hit the pause button in your own brain to be coming up with your next defense, right? And and we all do it. If we're in an argument or a misunderstanding, we're all, we're all mounting our argument, our defense. But what it really means is I'm going to hit the pause button. I'm going to genuinely listen to what you're actually saying in this moment. And I'm going to be willing to try to see it from your perspective. Now, I'm not saying this is easy, right? Because if right. I'm angry or I'm sad, my brain is firing, right? I'm, 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 I'm an emotion that creates a lot of brain activity. You're in a, in a glass in a, case in a, of emotion. Yeah, I'm in a glass case emotion already, a red light emotion. But what it means is if, I, if I'm genuinely committed to this relationship and I want to see the circumstance get better, so we hope that that's our goal that then we say, okay, I'm going to try to really see this, which then usually means that as opposed to then just coming up with a defense, I'm working towards a solution. Right. And, and I think you know, I mentioned in the last segment the whole the problem of, of expectations. Mm. And so the perspective taking would really help with that. It, you know, if you've got a parent 
So, like, how would you nudge them along to see the perspective of their, say, adolescent son who feels like he is falling short of their expectations in terms of academic achievement and, and going to college? Well, that if you could stop and see that from their perspective, you would immediately begin to recognize that most likely that feels bad to that person. And I, and I don't, you know, a, a good parent will, will respond to their child feeling sad or feeling discouraged or feeling like they're less than. And they may see that as a growth opportunity. I love that phrase. This is a growth opportunity. Right. But it's still going to require you to respond and, and in probably a more gentle way. And so if, you, if a parent can put themselves in their child's perspective, then maybe the response is going to be more about, okay, how do we solve this negative emotion and then motivate to get out of the emotion and work towards the best version of themselves? Because parents sometimes the harshest thing that they have to deal with is recognize that their idea of what their kid is going to be may not live up to this expectation. You have to parent the kid that you get, not the kid that you want. And let, let me tell you two scenarios that I see. One is the parent who, the, or the apple does not fall far from the tree, where the parent realizes, wow, this kid, my kid is going through the same thing I did, and I'm powerless to stop it. But there's also the 180 degree different. There is, I, I was, I had my act together as a student. I was very disciplined, organized, and this kid, he does not care. He's totally disorganized. The, those, both of those are really hard for perspective taking. Because, so in the first scenario where it's not too far from the tree and, and they see the same pattern, you know, it's that instinct to protect. Oh my gosh, I want to protect my child from whatever painful outcome this issue had for me, right? It affected my social life and that felt awful. Or, you know, it was so hard for teachers to teach and I was always that kid in the class and I want to protect them from that. That's a great instinct. We want parents to be protective, but you've got to recognize that you are then hurting your kid from these expectations or the vice versa. It's really hard to wrap your brain around the fact that you've got a kid. And so then they've got this problem where their brain doesn't even recognize, like it's so foreign, they see it as irrational or they can see it as intentional. My kid is trying to piss me off. They know how I am and how I work and so they're doing it on purpose. So it's it's the problem of it, it's hitting that that emotional personal spot as opposed to just seeing it for what it is. Look, this is such an important topic and there's so much to discuss. I, this is not the last time we're going to have an episode devoted to this. But really, so how about a parting thought, Fights? Well, what's, if you're going to leave families out there that are struggling with a, a, a final thought, a mantra, something to, to a take away from this discussion, what would it be? Be willing to hit the pause button in your own brain to get out of the defensive to get into a validating perspective, be willing to think differently, be willing to do differently. Somebody recently said to me, it is never too late to pivot in your parenting, to pivot in your marriage, and really that we can always pivot within our family. Jonathan and his family were in the car for about an hour that Christmas day, driving ever deeper into the countryside. Eventually, they pulled into a sparse parking lot. It was in the middle of nowhere, with no visible buildings or other signs of civilization. They left the car and took a rustic pathway with wooden guardrails. They walked over a few hills toward the cadence of running water. The air didn't carry the scent of cold, mountain-fresh springs. Rather, it was muggy and musky. Over the next hill arose what looked like smoke, but this soon was revealed to be steam. They had arrived at a hot springs. The kids returned to the car and got into the swim gear that Dad and Nancy had smuggled. It didn't register with them that the adults had headed directly to the springs. You see, Dad and Nancy didn't need to change into swimsuits. They just doffed and plunged into the water because the Christmas Day family outing was to a nudist hot springs. Brandon Gage is our producer. Sean Beck is our sound engineer and theme music composer. Executive producers are Dave Verhagen and Frank Askell. Contributing this episode were Jonathan Hederly and Mara Teal. Jamil Moore is our graphic design intern, and Bailey Sito is our marketing intern. Lastly, Amanda Bergman is the biggest Jimmy Fallon fan we know. You'll find more practical psychology to enhance your life on our website, 
psychbytes.com. Be sure to follow us on Twitter at psychbytes. You can also reach us via email, podcast at psychbytes.com. Please send us questions. We love answering them. Also, share your thoughts and suggestions for future show topics. We love suggestions too. Until next time, I'm Craig Pullman. I'm Fights, and this is the Psych Bites Podcast. <laughs>